Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Data Meet Design, Making Information Beautiful. In the context of increasing fact fractiousness about what a fact is, uh, how data is presented has probably never been more important. And we have the opportunity today to explore this and to more fully appreciate the work of one of the Aspen Institute's founding visionaries, Herbert Beyer, because one of the more remarkable things he did was create an atlas. And uh, as you'll learn, if you don't already know, it uh, is extraordinarily comprehensive and it uh, did so much to set the agenda and set the standard for how we now visualize data. So to uh, lead the way for us, the co-curator of the extraordinary show on the Atlas that is at the Resnick Center for Herbert Beyer Studies, um, who has also, also authored a terrific book on the app Atlas, Ben Bennis is here to uh, talk to us about this. And uh, he is the Associate Professor of Art and Design History at Loyola University and has been working on the show for a while. Um, and the book for a while as well. So um, we have some slides that uh, hopefully should illuminate some of the key points um, that Ben is going to address for us. And uh, just going to start with this one, which is uh, an image of the atlas itself and its uh, packaging. So Ben, start us off. Tell us about this project. What caused it to happen? Um, and why would a corporation do something like this. All right, well, first of all, thank you all so much for uh, coming out today. Um, it's really a privilege to be speaking about this here uh, at, at this particular uh, Ideas Festival because this is the uh, 70th anniversary of uh, the creation of the Atlas, which was first presented to the public on the Aspen Institute campus at the International Design Conference uh, in, in, in 1953 by Herbert Beyer and, and Walter Pepke. Uh, and it's, it's been a, a really rewarding experience to work on uh, this exhibition at the Resnick Center for uh, Beyer Studies. And I just want to take a moment to thank my collaborators on this um, really uh, satisfying and exciting uh, project. Uh, uh, Lissa Ballinger, the director of uh, the, the Resnick Center, uh, my co-curator, Bernard Jazar, and Katie and Paul of KVD, who put together a wonderful uh, exhibition, and if you haven't already seen it, um, I hope you'll, you'll go over there. And um, the exhibition would not be possible uh, without the support of the uh, Toby Lewis Fund, so we're grateful for that. Uh, as for why a corporation, uh, a company, Container Corporation of America, would create an atlas. Um, it's a complicated story, and that's one of the reasons we decided to put uh, this exhibition together. Uh, Container Corporation was a Chicago-based packaging company, and the founder and president of Container Corporation, Walter Pepke, was also the founder of the Aspen Institute and was a major supporter of uh, the arts, in particular modern art, and he was uh, closely linked with uh, Herbert Beyer and worked on a lot of uh, projects with him. And in 1947, shortly after Herbert Beyer had moved to uh, Aspen, uh, Walter Pepke asked if Bayer would design an atlas that would basically mark the 25th anniversary of Container Corporation of America's founding. Uh, they had, as a lot of companies uh, do, they had created promotional materials uh, to celebrate different anniversaries to present to stockholders and clients, uh, and they had done one in 1936 on their 10th uh, anniversary. Uh, in the interim, there had been the Second World War, the 1936 version was out of date, it had been a very popular atlas, uh, and so Walter Pepke asked Herbert Beyer if he would update that atlas. Uh, Pepke was anticipating a fairly conventional atlas, uh, one that would just be kind of beautifully designed, but would function in the way that other atlases uh, do, but Herbert Beyer had a really distinct vision. Uh, he wanted this atlas to really be 
an entirely different kind of atlas, an atlas that would conceive of geography in much broader terms than conventional geographic atlases uh, do, and he used really radical design strategies to, uh, to do it. And the name, Geographic Atlas, right? You can see from the spacing, the, mm -hmm. the hyphen isn't there because he ran out of space. Right. What's that about? Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Bayer chose as the title geographic, this hyphenated term, because he really wanted to emphasize that this atlas was about graphic presentations, that in addition to maps, uh, all kinds of charts, diagrams, pictures would be used to create a really kind of comprehensive uh, uh, and nuanced picture of, of, of the world. And so he wanted the title to, to emphasize that. And the graphic itself, notice, doesn't center the United States. Mm -hmm. So um, from the start, this is not your patron's atlas, mm -hmm. um, or perhaps the atlas the patron thought um, he was going to get. Yeah. So um, how did that come to be? Talk a little bit about Bayer's background as a student of the Bauhaus. Right. So um, we're looking here on the, the left at the title page of the atlas. It has a little diagram that talks about the different overlapping fields that the atlas uh, is going to address. Uh, and then on the right, we see a diagram that accompanied an article about the educational philosophy of the Bauhaus, which was the school where Bayer initially trained, this art and design school in Germany, uh, coterminous with the years of the, the Weimar Republic from 1919 to 1933 only existed for a short period, but had a huge impact on 20th century art and design. Uh, and Bayer initially studied there, and then for several years worked there as an instructor. Uh, and the philosophy that he took from his few years at the Bauhaus really shaped the rest of uh, uh, his, his career. And that philosophy uh, basically holds that, that, that art can be uh, a, a unifying force in, in society, that it can integrate all kinds of different facets of life, and it, that this philosophy really emerged as a response to the First World War, to political polarization in the aftermath of the war, and the idea was that art and design could play a part in creating a more unified society by creating a more unified environment. And so this diagram that here shows how all of these different disciplines, which at times could be a bit specialized and not really speak to each other, uh, by kind of coordinating and finding a kind of common language to speak in, could create a, a total artwork. And that was really Bayer's goal all through his, his career, and one that he, um, I think the Atlas is really exemplary of. And certainly his work on this campus mm. is the apotheosis of that, right? Right, exactly. I think the way in which the buildings, we have the mural on the outside of the building that, that, that we're in, um, which relates directly to the landscape. We have Byers' um, uh, earthworks uh, as you're walking along and you see these mounds and, and, and dips. Um, those are also in response to the surrounding landscape. And so this idea of creating a kind of total unified uh, environment uh, was, was part of his, his life's work. It's interesting to just look at that. Is that Walter Gropius designed? Um, you know the, that uh, that it feels kind of radical or uncomfortable. We mm -hmm. don't we don't unfortunately necessarily train people to be polymaths. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And I think liar idea. Right, and and I think in some ways the diagram, which uh, it's a little bit small to see here, but you can see each of those circles represents a different field related to geography. So in addition to what we traditionally think of geography, there's economics, there's meteorology, astronomy, demographics, uh, all of these different uh, uh, fields, and Bayer has them all overlapping and interrelated. So um, some of the radicalness of his approach, I think, is nicely captured in this slide, which compares the representation of more traditional atlases and then one of the uh, designs that he included in his, and um, just as a ongoing promo for the show, um, there are some extraordinary drawings as he worked his way towards uh, this ultimate design. But talk to us a little bit about what he was sort of pushing against uh, 
in, in the, the way that he was trying to conceive mm -hmm. of how to present information. Yeah, um, so what we, we see on the, the right is a double page spread from one of the first pages in the, the, the atlas, which shows the solar system, uh, both showing the planets in relation to the sun, uh, in their, their proportion. Uh, we see them arranged vertically and it gives us a sense of the scale. And then at the very top of that double page spread, we see a chart that shows the relative distances of, of the planets. That kind of material, that kind of information was often shown in atlases and on the left um, showing a uh, page from Rand McNally's Goods School Atlas, which was pretty much the authoritative textbook uh, at, at, at the time. And it's the same information, more or less, but you can see how radical Herbert Byers' uh, formal approach is, the way he composes uh, the, 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 the page. Uh, traditional book design, uh, tended to be symmetrical in its composition. You could kind of split it down the middle on a central axis. Uh, often the illustrations were kind of densely packed and, and surrounded by these kind of constraining frames and it had a, a fairly static quality. And one of the things that came out of Byers' work at the Bauhaus, uh, on lots of the work as, as a graphic designer there and then subsequently uh, in, in advertising uh, was creating more dynamic, engaging compositions. And so in this case, we see he basically, if you look at that very top compartment on the left uh, in that, that the older page, uh, you can see we just see a, a little uh, sliver of the sun. Uh, it's like Bayer took that, turned it on its side, and then extended the sun into the page next to it to give it its full circumference. And so we see this, this, this page that's much more dramatic. Uh, it's asymmetrical, which was unusual for kind of conventional textbooks. Uh, and there's also these areas of kind of open blank space. And buyers not afraid to leave these open areas and use them as kind of active elements in, in the page. And so the whole textbook. Uh, was really kind of engaging in, in, in this way and, and often unfolded with a lot of drama, almost like you know, a, a movie or something that was often what it was compared to. Yeah, one, one of his colleagues is quoted as saying that there was, a, there was an active desire to make design emotional mm. and to give it a sense of, of motion. Yeah, and I, 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 think, I think that's a really uh, an important point, uh, it, you know, that buyer comes from a generation which also included several educators who were looking at new technologies and seeing how audiences were responding to cinema, to advertising, to all of these different types of mass media. And education, by comparison, was kind of stuck in the past. And so Does designers- Does that feel familiar to anyone? Sorry, <laughs> right, right. Uh, the debate continues. Uh, uh, and um, uh, Bayer is part of this generation who is thinking about how can some of the lessons uh, from realms like entertainment or advertising be absorbed and, and used to kind of rethink education. And, and something you've talked to me about in, in characterizing his interest, uh, the, the notion of map literacy, of mm -hmm. trying to help people understand visual information or understand information because of the way it's presented visually. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to me, this design is certainly all about doing that. Yeah, I think one, one thing that makes Buyer's Atlas really exceptional and kind of different than, than its commercial counterparts. Uh, and, and again, this was a privately published uh, uh, atlas. It, it was produced in, in 30,000 copies, which is sounds like a lot, but compared to a commercial reference work by Rand McNally, that's, that's not really that many. Uh, and Container Corporation gave this work away for free to clients of its you know, choosing, but also to lots of research institutions and public libraries. Uh, and the concept behind the, the atlas was really an educational one. It was about teaching map literacy, not just you know, how to locate place names on a, on a map or how to identify uh, relief, but how to really, uh, I, I think it might be more akin to when we talk about information uh, literacy, being able to think critically about the role of the author or the designer in, in uh, uh, creating the, the, the information. Uh, and so a lot of these are kind of um, 
work to get the reader to think about how they're made. So you've talked about the, the traditional atlas, and part of what I found fascinating was the degree to which Bayer actually collaborated with mm -hmm. Rand McNally mm -hmm. um, and with others. So can you talk a little bit about what we're seeing here and the degree to which it's collaborative and mm -hmm. Bayer sort of upping the game? Right, yeah. Uh, I think it's you know, important to remember as much as you know, Bayer is you know, really this, this, this pioneer and his atlas is radically different in appearance, it's really building on the work of a lot of uh, uh, precursors. And you know, as much as I'm sort of using Rand McNally's school atlas as, as a foil, Bayer very much admired uh, uh, the work um, uh, that people like J. Paul Good, who created that, that classic um, atlas, um, had created and wanted to uh, build on it, as, as you say. And so the central map that we see there, this map of the world that is color-coded to show areas of relief and depression, that comes from Rand McNally. And Rand McNally actually printed the atlas for Container Corporation, and they provided the more conventional maps that were used in this atlas. And so we see at the center there a Rand McNally uh, map, but surrounded by it are all the accompanying graphics that Bayer developed independently or drew from other sources. Uh, in some ways, he played a kind of curatorial role, finding graphs and diagrams in other textbooks, seeing what worked well, what didn't, what could be improved, and used these accompanying graphics to give us a more nuanced understanding of that map at the center. And so that map at the center, we can see the relief in the color coding, but we see that little detail in the far right corner, which we've uh, blown up uh, here on, on the left. And it gives us a cross-section view of, el of elevation and depression. And so we can understand that the highest points on Earth and the lowest points on Earth have about 11 miles of distance be between them. And that's sort of something that's hard to conceive when we just look at that map in the, the center. Um, and so all of these ways of uh, uh, showing information in as many different types of iterations as possible gets viewers to think about the role of the designer, all of the different ways that, that something can be shown, and that all of these are approximations, that all of them have their advantages and, and their limitations. It also gives you a relative sense of you know, the highest highs and the lowest lows. Right, right. And, and Bayer put in a cloud. What we were talking mm -hmm. about before at the exhibition is he seems to have a little obsession with clouds. There so is kind of a cloud fixation. Loaded one there for you um, with uh, all of the interest around um, the Himalayas. So I, this issue of the kind of information that he's adding here, you'll see on the, the lower right there's a pie chart, which of course you know did not join us when the dinosaurs were on the earth, but was... Um, invented, but part of um, what I think is so interesting in the upper right, um, there's this uh, graphic that's trying to share population versus uh, parts of the world that were actually covered in water. Because uh, as, as you pointed out, the Rand McNally Atlas does foreground land mass, um, and in that sense it's a little uh, disingenuous. Mm -hmm. but, but talk a little bit about the what an isotype is and and that whole idea of visualizing information right so the the, the method that uh, the design method that Herbert Beyer is using in that little chart in the upper right of the page spread that we've blown up here on the left uh, the name for that approach is isotype it's an acronym for international system of typographic picture education uh, it is a uh, an approach to design that was developed not by Herbert Bayer, but by several of his contemporaries who were working in Vienna during the same time that Bayer was at the Bauhaus. Uh, and their work was widely circulated. Herbert Bayer encountered the work in, in all kinds of um, uh, places. And, and by the time Bayer's working on the Atlas, it had really become uh, a, a uh, widely embraced uh, uh, approach, and it's based on the idea that having quant quantitative uh, pictures where you can grasp things by counting them is a really effective way of conceiving of something. And so we might look at that world map, and we're told that 
three quarters of the world is ocean, but it's kind of hard to, to recognize that with all those irregular forms. Uh, but when we convert it into these equal countable units, we can see the world is three quarters water, one quarter land, and we can go even further and say of the world's population, in this case, each one of those uh, little dark figures uh, is uh, half a billion people. The population was about two and a half uh, uh, billion uh, uh, at that, uh, in the 1950s when, when Bayer did this. We can see about half of that population lives in an area of that one quarter of the world's landmass uh, that is only one thirtieth of that. And so uh, being able to kind of conceive of space uh, in these kind of quantitative terms, you know, again, if you were to read this, uh, you know, uh, as text, it would be kind of really hard to conceive of it or, or absorb it, but seeing it visually uh, kind of really, I think, entrenches that, that, that information. One of the things that you mentioned was the, the, his taking the isotype method from colleagues. It, it, one of the fascinating things, again, about how collaborative this Atlas project is in the hands of someone who was an artist but also had design training is this notion that you could be collaborative. And as you were saying before, it's striking because this was at the moment when art criticism was starting to really reify the pioneer and the mm -hmm. star and the person who stands alone. Um, it, any particular thoughts about, was, was that just how he was because of the Bauhaus? Well, or was, it, there, know, was there a tension there? Uh, there? There is, in fact, a tension because I, I think you, most of the, uh, his colleagues at the Bauhaus who also became famous, uh, when you look at their pronouncements and their, their writings, um, they all talk about collectivity and they all talk about uh, art being this, this collaborative effort and they see the idea of the sort of individual genius as this kind of antiquated myth. Uh, but many of them, like Bayer, when they get to the, the US and uh, they're sort of trying to carve out a professional path, uh, they begin to kind of embrace this mythology and you know, they don't quite admit the extent to which their work is, is really a kind of conversation with each other and it's sometimes collaborative in the spirit of, of sharing and sometimes it's competitive and uh, you know, they're one-upping each other. Um, but most of these um, uh, approaches that, that Bayer was using uh, are not ones that he invented. They're ones that lots of people are arriving at at the same moment. I think what makes Bayer's Atlas so unique is his curatorial role, thinking about how this could all be synthesized. So let's take a closer look at one of those graphics. Um, changing employment. Mm -hmm. Talk us through what this says and why it was a radical way of mm -hmm. trying to say that. Yeah, so um, one of the ideas behind uh, um, isotype was that it would be intuitive and people who aren't specialists would be able to access information. And, and really the idea behind isotype was about democratizing uh, information, making it s uh, accessible to people. And so it wasn't necessarily, you know, obviously it's, it's a bit crude, numbers are, tend to be simplified and, and rounded down, and so you know, people who work in statistics are not necessarily going to be communicating with one another using this, but in presenting uh, really complicated, specialized information to people outside of a particular discipline, uh, this approach was you know, about, about making uh, information that could be understood rather quickly. Uh, and it often involved looking at raw data, thinking about how it could best be expressed. And so, you know, do you have all of these figures all starting from the left margin or do you have an access in this case if you want to show the shift in uh, um, employment uh, as jobs leave agriculture and go into um, other areas, manufacturing, uh, et cetera, um, between the late 19th and, and mid uh, 20th century. Uh, part of the idea was to get people to start 
asking questions and making connections. And so on its own, this, does, this chart doesn't explain why that happens or what the consequences of that are. Do the people who uh, leave farming for manufacturing have higher standard of living as a result, or does income go up? But the idea is that this chart, which is a small detail on a page that I didn't bring in that has a lot of other information, uh, when seen against all of these other charts, you would begin to connect dots, and you would begin to read this information in, in different ways, and you would have certain answers. Uh, you know, what effect did this have on uh, population growth in cities or depopulation in, in rural towns? And so part of this was about creating active readers who could forge their own paths and connections through all of this information. So it, I, I find it so intriguing that in a time when, particularly if you watch television news, but certainly you know print journalism as well, is constantly trying to convey complexity. This may look a little old-fashioned, but but the the number of layers of not only information but design thinking that that went into it is is quite extraordinary. To this point of information as provocation, um, talk to us about this, because here, again, you have a combination of a traditional map, but he has pulled out a couple of key data sets, income, diet, and life expectancy. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think um, made Bayer's approach uh, uh, in, in the Atlas so successful was the way in which you could kind of mix and match and coordinate different modes of representation together. And so we have maps, we have charts that use countable pictograms, uh, we have different kinds of diagrams, and they're all done in a kind of uniform style so that we can see them together and draw connections. And so we can see something like um, access to, to resources or living standards, how they're distributed geographically, but also understand the, the quantitative uh, uh, differences. Uh, and certainly, you know, I, I think something that, that also makes the Atlas unique is that it does have a kind of narrative, a kind of argument. And I think we don't often think of atlases as you know, telling a story. In fact, all atlases, I think, have implicit stories, but Bayer is really explicit, uh, both in, in, I think, telling a story in which he sees globalization and um, uh, creation of kind of international bodies like the UN as a, a kind of desirable goal, uh, but he also sees all kinds of potential obstacles uh, to that. And the Atlas is a bit of, a, as, as you said, a kind of provocation to get people to think about uh, measures that we might take to address things like uh, uh, inequality. Um, there's also still a lot of debates about uh, even this, this particular way of showing information and to what extent it entrenches uh, uh, certain, certain biases that perhaps showing averages, uh, like you know, we can see the USA is you know, more than, uh, uh, you know, is triple uh, what uh, uh, Europe is, um, uh, you know, in terms of their, their average uh, uh, income, and you know, what, uh, uh, 12 times uh, what are described as under, underdeveloped areas, but, you could imagine a way of showing it where you would show the whole range uh, and show, say, within developed areas, to what extent is there you know, inequity. Uh, and within areas that are described here as, as underdeveloped, to, to what extent are there um, you know, extremely wealthy uh, uh, people as well. And, and so uh, this is kind of the beginning of a way of working that designers have continued to build on and engage with and, and debate, and I think the Atlas is really valuable for that as, as well. Yeah, the, the provocation of red versus green mm -hmm. as opposed to that becoming a caricature that's mm -hmm. kind of self -offered. Right. I do think it, it the, the use for life expectancy of a human shadow mm -hmm. is sort of very moving in yeah. the midst of a lot of data that is sort of much more uh, aggressive. You know, that is a, such a, a great observation, and I think it's one of the things that also makes this uh, uh, so special is that on the one hand, a lot of the information seems rather impersonal, right? It's quantitative. Uh, and yet, I think buyer's interest in 
surrealism and, and, and uh, different artistic tendencies uh, comes into things like that cast uh, shadow. And uh, one of his um, um, uh, colleagues and, and collaborators, uh, the designer Leo Leone, who's probably best known as a children's book illustrator, um, but worked with Bayer on several projects, uh, when he said, you know, when he saw the atlas, he said, you know, what I love is that it's so human and so full of little surprises in spite of how scientific it is. Yeah, it, it makes the notion of life expectancy very tender. Mm -hmm. um, this is another image that kind of really pushes that notion of being editorial mm -hmm. in a way that I think will feel extremely contemporary, if not urgent to us. Talk us through what this represents. Yeah, so this is uh, another one of those instances where Bayer is collaborating with, with, with a colleague and is building on that colleague's work. Uh, in this case, Buckminster Fuller uh, also has an Aspen Institute connection. The Fuller Dome is um, nearby. Uh, Buckminster Fuller had developed this particular projection, this map projection, this way of showing um, the continents with minimal distortion to their, their, their shapes um, and also minimal distortion to uh, uh, area, which is something that's very hard to do on a map. And, Fuller was also really interested in questions of energy production, access to, uh, uh, to energy, and Fuller had basically come up with an equation to calculate how much energy is produced mechanically, right, without, uh, uh, you know, beyond uh, human uh, labor, and came up with a particular unit that is, you know, like 38 times the amount of work that a human being could do manually. Uh, and then Fuller looked at how that energy production and consumption is distributed around the world. And so each one of those little dots is, uh, uh, represents a certain unit of energy. And so we can see the red figures that are dispersed across the different continents represent population. Each one of those is 1% of the world's population, so there are 100 uh, uh, figures altogether. And we can see places like South Asia and East Asia, uh, as well as Europe, uh, have considerably larger populations than, say, North America or South America. But North America, we can see, has vastly more uh, uh, energy production. And so, again, this was uh, a really dramatic way to uh, uh, express uh, inequality um, and um, uh, really get audiences uh, to ask questions about why things were the way they were and whether they might be different. Why U.S. energy consumption looks like a massive parking lot <laughs> right. in 1953 compared to uh, the rest of the world. Um, this is a different take on isotype, it seems, in mm -hmm. as much as it's... Uh, it seems a lot more conservative, and mm. then you have this crazy arcing arrow. Mm. Right. And along with clouds, arrows are probably another one of Bayer's favorite motifs. And if you go to the exhibition, you'll see not only the graphics uh, for the atlas, but his advertisements, his paintings, they're always packed with clouds and, and, and arrows. Um, in this case, the, this is the final image of the atlas, and when you see it in the atlas, it's very striking because a lot of the pages are rather you know, elaborate, uh, fairly layered and dense with information, and this last page is rather stark, and it basically is showing two things. Um, that top little area diagram uh, shows the what was then understood to be the amount of land that was required to clothe and feed a single human being adequately. Scientists have since, I think, changed their ideas about uh, whether there's actually a unit that's you know, required to support uh, a certain amount of life. But at the time, uh, the, the literature that Bayer was looking at was showing that the world population meant that as it was in 1950, uh, we, there was already a deficit in terms of the amount of land that was, was, was available. Uh, and then he has a predictive diagram uh, at, at the, the, the bottom showing the world's population in 1950, which was uh, at about two and a half billion, and shows where he 
or where the, 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 the scientists he was consulting uh, see the population going. In fact, he vastly underestimates it. Uh, 2000, he, he uh, has uh, 3 billion people, and we were already at 6 billion when we got to 2000, but then he vastly overestimates uh, population growth uh, beyond that, and we have these you know, staggeringly large numbers. But I think the idea uh, in this, this last image was, uh, again, to conclude the atlas with this dramatic challenge to the, uh, uh, to the readers about how are we collectively going to address um, kind of looming environmental uh, crises, looming crises that are predicted uh, to come from uh, uh, overpopulation. Uh, and uh, that's another thing that I think makes the Atlas unique is the way it foregrounds the issue of environment. Um, certainly you could find that kind of information in specialized sources during this time, but general reference works were not yet making a big deal about environment. And 75 years later, looking at this and getting the sense of activism around design um, is quite compelling. Um, so this uh, image shows a lot, again, about the um, isotype uh, that um, lines out the whole population um, and combines it with the other elements of uh, the uh, more traditional map that we have. Um, I, I think the, the, the question here, Ben, is you had talked about there being a kind of civic moment that Bayer is either entering or reverting to in being this democratic offering information that you know, would otherwise be pretty hard for a standalone individual to receive. Why do you think? Why do you think that is? What do you think was compelling to him? Yeah, you know, I think um, I think there, there there are several answers to that. Uh, you know, one is that Bayer by this point had a lot of experience working in advertising, working in propaganda, was particularly good at at those. Uh, uh, you know, at, at, was particularly skillful at persuasively communicating his clients' messages. Um, and I think in some cases he recognized that there was a certain amount of manipulation uh, in, in involved in that. And particularly once he left New York and left a lot of his jobs with advertising agencies behind and was in Aspen and sort of had the luxury of being able to step back and regroup, uh, he began to really think more about the social responsibility of the designer and really saw education and providing information to, you know, the, in, in the sort of least manipulated way uh, uh, possible uh, as a kind of goal to, to uh, pursue. And in maps like this, we see him, uh, or in pages like this, we see him taking a map like the one on the right that was provided to him by Rand McNally. Uh, that was the standard political topographic maps that were used in all of their atlases. And we see the page on the left where he has all of this kind of gloss and commentary that helps us read and make sense and understand uh, uh, the map in different ways and asks us to question why maps look the way they do, and what decisions um, the designers may be making that tell one story rather than uh, uh, another, to think about what's shown and what's not shown. And so I think that's what we're, we're seeing with these. This is a totally unfair question, but I'm gonna ask it. Do you think this, this is an evolution in some ways that's trying to make up for or apologize for his early work in Germany mm -hmm. on behalf of the social democratic? <laughs> Uh, Party? Well, yeah, so I, I, I think he would probably not uh, put it in those terms, but I think uh, I find that a persuasive um, argument. I mean, I think you just, you know, so, so just to, to briefly provide, you know, the, the background, uh, 1933, the Nazis come to power. Um, Bayer, along with several of his colleagues at, at the Bauhaus, uh, stay for varying amounts of time during the uh, uh, Nazi regime, and 
Bayer is fairly late in leaving Germany. He leaves in 1938, and so there is about five years that he's there. And while he's there, he takes several commissions uh, that were, you know, uh, uh, kind of gave uh, cover to, 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 to the Nazis. And, and um, uh, that's something that I think he was really uncomfortable with later on, and we can see that because he, you know, made an effort to downplay that when, you know, he, he um, would show a lot of his, his, his earlier work, that stuff fell out. And so that indicates to me that there was a kind of wrestling with, with that, even if he didn't directly talk about uh, that, that, that work. And I think this interest in uh, a civic art that would really serve the, the, the interests of, um, you know, there'd be a kind of trustee of the public uh, is something that um, uh, he's increasingly invested in as he gets older. Well, it, it, it's an extraordinary uh, job that you've done of interpreting for us someone who's an incredibly inventive designer, but also has the sense of ethics that's quite um, extraordinary. Um, so we have some time for questions, uh, and we have a microphone available to pounce if people uh, like to ask Ben. Thank you. This is so thank you, this is very this is fascinating and I really enjoyed the deep dive into it. Um, this is my first encounter with isotypes, so thank you for educating me about it. But I'm curious, because it reminds me very much, there's a, a section in one of um, Tufti's books about information visualization mm -hmm. where um, he sort of deconstructs some of the information visualization that was used um, in the, um, you know, the congressional panels after the Challenger disaster. Mm -hmm. And if I recall correctly, they were using some of the same typology in terms of like, you know, fractional shuttle mm -hmm. um, booster displays and things like that. And um, I was wondering if you could comment on, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with that example, but if you could comment on, you know, that and its relationship to some of this, you know, typography or, you know, visual display of information, you know, was that, you know, just an abuse or misuse or is this a, a visual language that sort of lends itself to oversimplifying the story in ways that are critically bad? Yeah, I, I, that is a, a wonderful question. And uh, for for those of you um, who, who don't know, Edward Tufte is um, kind of a, a, an authority for the past several decades on uh, data visualization. He's not particularly fond of isotype. He, as, as you said, he, he uh, uh, sees it as kind of dumbing down uh, the, the, the material. He sees it as not kind of information dense or information rich enough. Uh, and I think there's, there's an argument to make that you maybe can't get to like the, the fourth decimal point or something with it, right? Numbers are rounded, uh, but what the inventor or, or one of the main champions of isotype, a social scientist named Otto Neurath, who is based in Vienna, and Bayer also uh, uh, evoked this, this idea as well, uh, is this idea, well, what good are really precise numbers if no one remembers them, right? It's better, perhaps, to remember generalized, rough relationships uh, if you're not a specialist, uh, then to forget really exact in information. And so that was the thinking behind this, is that it was really a kind of method that was used as, as an entry point for lay people to grasp something that otherwise could be really complicated. Thank you. I'm, I'm kind of curious. So. Uh, how has data representation evolved since this time in, in really modern day? Are there some things happening now that are either mm -hmm. building upon this or changing the paradigm somewhat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a, a, an excellent question. Um, I, I think it's become much more sophisticated, uh, particularly given uh, what you can do interactively. Um, you know, the idea that um, all of these kind of layers we're talking about, you know, you can, I mean, even just using your map, you can select all of these uh, kind of layers. And, and so rather than having to, you know, shift between different pages, you can now kind of have that layering within this, a, a single image. So uh, um, I think the, the uh, data visualization has become much more sophisticated as a result of the technology, but I think the fundamental principles 
uh, I think, uh, continue to be used. And, and I think uh, uh, you know, there's, there's really excellent uh, uh, examples of data visualization that you'll see in, in you know, sources like the, the New York Times um, uh, you know, that, that, that will really make complex stories comprehensible. Uh, but you know, often it's about allowing viewers to recognize patterns. Uh, and I think that's the, the fundamental uh, uh, idea is that um, you know, when, if you have a table of numbers, they all have the same visual weight, and so it's hard to see a pattern in it. But as soon as you translate that graphically, you create a kind of silhouette or a, a, a picture uh, that is much easier to kind of hold in your mind. And I think even the more complex types of data visualization we see today uh, are still about doing that. When I read Ben's book, the first thing I did was look at the design elements that are now part of PowerPoint software. Mm -hmm. And it's all about giving you these various tactics to mm -hmm. shift focus. They're pretty symmetrical, but still. Um, you know, there, there was so much realizing that this was all done literally by hand, as it right. were. Um, yeah. It was very, very different. Other questions? I think there's somebody behind you. Okay. Do you think that it is possible to visualize and represent data in a completely unbiased way? That is a great question. Uh, I, I don't think it is. I think it's something that, uh, to the extent that you can be transparent about places where there is bias, to the extent that you can bring in the viewer to see your methodology, to see where you made decisions that might reflect bias, uh, I think is, is really the um, best uh, 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 possible approach. But I think you know, in, information is always a matter of editing, selecting, and that in itself is going to be kind of an incomplete picture. I think we had two more. Hi, Ben. So uh, I'm very aware of this, but the Atlas is, you know, it's such a particular moment in time, and I'm hoping you can share with everyone here about what you feel like are the, the lessons learned or the lasting impact or what is most relevant today when you're thinking about this whole project, not just about data visualization, but the entire expanse of the Atlas. And let me just, we had one more question there. Why don't you ask your question, and then Ben, you can answer both. I was kind of curious from a client designer relationship if the container corporation knew what they were getting into. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I heard the project cost $400,000 and took however many years. Mm -hmm. and, and I just was curious because I think they had previously done an atlas that was more normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. that's So legacy two different ways. Right, right. Uh, exactly. And I think those are... are Perfect questions to, to answer to, uh, uh, together. Uh, they did not know what they were getting into uh, because the Atlas was supposed to come out in 1951, which would have been the 25th anniversary, and instead it went two years beyond schedule and came out in 1953. Uh, and it cost twice as much as it was going to, but Walter Pepke and Container Corporation uh, really believed in the, this, the, the spirit of the project and um, uh, uh, for that reason, they, they, they encouraged uh, Bayer. And, and I think one of the important lessons, to go to, to Liz's question, uh, is the importance of collaboration across disciplines. You know, Bayer was not himself a scientist or a, geography, he, he, a geographer. He was a designer. He consulted with, with scientists. He brought in other uh, uh, artists. And I think what the, the sort of ideal is that, that Bayer... Uh, promoted was that a designer would understand the subject that they were tasked to design and that the expert who uh, um, was providing the data would also appreciate the designer's work and might think about even from the beginning, the, the, how they're, they're uh, uh, pursuing their research, uh, think about how it might be presented to uh, the public. And so it was really kind of, Bayer was asking for more collaboration and, and cross-pollination uh, uh, across disciplines and particularly between experts and, and designers. And we, we can all ponder ourselves the degree to which that has uh, 
endured uh, that aspiration and that legacy. Ben, thank you so much. I encourage everyone to go see the show and read Ben's book. Thank you so much. <laughs>